yeah, my name is Gonzalo Parra. I am I am part of the ICB Steering Council. I am the board of directors representation representative. And the idea of this new project is to join together, to bring together as much as possible from the structured bioinformatics community. This is supposed to be a collaboration between 3D Bioinfo community from Elixir, but also from ICB, ICB Student Council, 3D Bioinfo, 3D SIG, and as many other communities as, as want to join this effort. And I hope you will enjoy. This is the first edition from many. This is a topic-based edition, which will run uh, once every two months. And I hope you enjoy this first one and join us for, for the next ones. And now um, Dr. Vincent Sutt is going to chair this session. So I will give the word to him. Thanks a lot for joining. Thank you, Gonzalo. Uh, so before introducing our first speaker, I would just like to take a, a few seconds to thank Katrina Hale, David Lloyd, and Gonzalo Parra for coordinating this uh, webinar. It was a very uh, uh, strong and, and very uh, uh, intensive work. So thank you very much uh, for, for this. So our first speaker will be Dr. Merve Yagida. So Dr. Yagida obtained an engineer and master degree at the Ecole Supérieure de Biotechnologie in Strasbourg. Then she obtained a second master, this time in informatics. And after several internships at the University of Basel, the University of Freiburg, and also at Merck in Germany, she started a PhD in chemoinformatics at the University of Strasbourg in the group of Professor Didier Rognon. Then she obtained her PhD in 2022, and uh, she's now a research scientist in computational chemistry in the company ICTOS in Paris, France. So Dr. Guida will present her work today on target-focused library design for efficient heat discovery. So the Zoom floor is yours, Merve. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, so I'm really pleased to be here today, and I would like to thank uh, all the organizers uh, for this opportunity. And um, so the work that I'm going to talk about is um, mainly for molecular library design, but using uh, the protein target information in order to build target focused libraries. And it's the work that I conducted at the University of Strasbourg during my PhD uh, under supervision of uh, Dr. Didier Wien. Um, uh, with this, um, first I would like to show you some nice pictures of, of Strasbourg, particularly in spring. And, um, and I would like to tell you a story of uh, something that should be normally like a routine in daily life. So I was actually uh, looking for um, for a book. And um, I, when you're looking to buy something, then you visit shops, right? So I actually visited, I went to the city center and I visited some uh, libraries uh, where I can find the books that I'm looking for. But uh, the thing is that I ended up doing a couple of them and uh, didn't find what I was looking for. And then I decided to look at the map and try to, you know, um, with the resources that we have today, we have internet and we have uh, access to pretty much everything. So of course I went onto the internet first and I actually tried to find uh, different shops where I can find what I was looking for to, to buy the books that I was looking for. for but I ended up uh, realizing that there are too much options than what I can truly uh, explore. And this experience made me think about what we experience in uh, computational chemistry or uh, computer edit drug design when we are doing virtual screening and the idea is to design a molecule for a specific target. We actually are exploring very vast chemical space and uh, we are not sure that the one that we are visiting we're going to find what we're looking for. So this is introducing my talk, um, which is uh, focused on uh, heat identification. Um, so today we have access to a, a large uh, number of molecules that we can design. And this chemical as, as space, uh, space, sorry, um, which is the assemble of compounds we can access is actually growing. It's interesting for medicinal chemistry point of view to have molecules that we can synthesize in the end because we need to test them. So we actually need um, more resources than what is currently uh, available to explore that vast chemical space efficiently because it's just not possible to enumerate all of the molecules and to test all of the possibilities. So 
this actually uh, to, to, to solve this, at least to propose some some solutions or to explore some potential solutions, we decide to invest uh, to investigate uh, how binary site comparison can also provide some insight here. So typically, um, the idea is that when exploring this large and very vast chemical space to find what we are looking for, we could do that smartly by using information known on the protein targets and to try to find molecules that would actually bind to, uh, that would have properties that are kind of complementary to the protein targets that we already have. So the idea is not to, to search and to test everything, but just to, to restrict the zone where we are looking for, where we are searching in order to find more efficiently. So basically we have the pocket, we will use the information to design the molecules and those molecules will be tested against the pockets to identify. Normally, um, with this protocol, we should uh, end up with a smaller uh, size or sl a smaller number of molecules that we have visited. And we are also hope that we will have higher hit rates since we use uh, specific information on the target. And we hope that there will be some complementarity in the molecules. And finally, we are also expecting this would uh, as a consequence, as a positive consequence would yield uh, lower screening costs and uh, enable faster identification. So with this, we decided to explore binary site comparison. Um, pocket comparison can be useful in a variety of, of, for a variety of problems. Uh, typically the idea is given two proteins A and B, if their site is similar, and we apply the similarities principle, which means that similar uh, ligand would bind to similar pockets, then we should be able to transfer this bind information. But the reality is that it's much more complex than that. It's just not similarity that would drive binding. The same ligands might bind for different reasons, but at least we hope that we can maybe transfer some fragments or I would say ligand pieces from one protein pocket to another one because the local environments of those proteins are similar. So this is basically the idea we're going to use here for the, for the design of the molecules. So we have uh, elaborated uh, this um, protocol, uh, this method called POEM, Pocket Oriented Elaboration of Molecules. Uh, basically what we do is here, we actually exploited known information of protein ligand uh, complexes. So given, um, a protein target, sorry, just need the pointer. So given a specific, uh, a typical protein target for from our database and is a uh, co-crystallized ligand, we cut um, bounds around uh, fragments to uh, identify fragments which are making uh, interactions with the targets. And then we compute the protein environment around those targets, uh, those fragments, sorry. So here, our database is composed of uh, fragments, which are ligand pieces, and they are protein environments for an entire database. On the other side, we have our protein target for which we want to design a molecule. We don't have any information of what could bind to that protein, but we characterize the pocket. We have tools to detect the pockets, and we have the same characteristic computed for this pocket as for uh, the uh, fragments environments in the database. And the next step is we compare the target clouds of points, so the environment, to uh, the environment of the fragments. And when they are similar, the idea is that we are going to transfer the information from uh, uh, the database to the, to the target. So typically we are going to align um, the sub pockets first and then use the same information to align uh, the fragments that are associated to those uh, sub pockets. And finally, we can link them with some algorithms and make a fully connected molecules. That's the idea, basic idea behind the POEM workflow. So we have actually uh, applied it and I would like to present first uh, how we do the protein uh, cavities comparison. So the environments around the fragments compared to the whole uh, target environment. Comparison is um, it's something that we do in everyday life. We compare objects. We do it maybe intuitively even. Uh, we have this ability to recognize shapes. And we also, for many of us, 
can see color. And with this, we can identify object C and somehow we don't necessarily assign scores, but we have some intuition that some two objects are more similar than to another one. And uh, we want to do this, but uh, computationally by analyzing also the shape and uh, the physical chemical properties of proteins. So typically in order to compare two protein bind sites, whatever the size, um, the idea first is to represent them because you have a lot of information, you have atoms and you want to uh, get uh, rid of unnecessary information and focus more on what is relevant and should be compared. And also, since we're doing it using computers, we need to provide a way that a computer can understand. So this is done at the step of representation, the mind site. And site representation can be a fingerprint. So typically counting yes or no, if some features are present, the features can be simple atoms or can be more complex than that, like pharmacophores, like triplets of distances. Um, we have, uh, Graph representations, we have um, cloud representations, so kind of a surface, but, but a discretized surface. We can use residues, list of residues. Um, there are many other ways to represent a protein pocket. And then after this representation, to compare two pockets, we will compare the representations. So if we have fingerprints, we can compare bitwise since they have exactly the same length. Or when we have graphs, we will be looking for clicks in these two graphs or uh, so two surfaces can be aligned. So we have different ways to do the comparison as well. And as you can see, uh, a comparison is actually tailored to the representation that you made of your, of your target. And finally, we have the scoring, which am I at quantifying uh, how much uh, we can detect similarity. So the idea is, is to have some, uh, I would say, I use it personally as a decision-making uh, tool. Uh, to discriminate between the very similar from what is, can be the noise. But the reality is that pocket comparison is challenging because like we, um, when you actually are selecting the features, you think intuitively that those features are as important, but maybe they are not. So we're not even sure about what we should be comparing between two buckets when we, for, for a specific uh, project. And uh, the second thing is that uh, the available methods actually do not uh, catch local similarity. Like most of them do not catch uh, local similarity, but two pockets can be actually globally dissimilar. If you look at uh, the information everywhere and you compare it, it would actually add more negative contribution in the scoring in the end, but, or even in the comparison, but, Actually, there are some small parts which are similar and can explain uh, the binding to a same ligand. And also we have problem with interpretability because the more complex it's getting, the less interpretable it could be. So we need the score to be interpretable. And when we have a, a tool that can yield an alignment, so superposition of the two objects, we can also visualize and see them. Currently is not a case for typically fingerprint space methods, not, not all of them at least. And um, it's, when we have alignment, it means that um, we can actually do other kind of uh, computational work with. Typically the work of design molecules is based mainly on alignment. And um, the, the method also should be applicable in absence of, of ligands. So this actually brought us to develop a new method for uh, Subpocket comparison, particularly. And for this, we have as per uh, the possibilities in computer vision. Uh, so, first of all, our method, uh, act for our method, actually, the, the site is represented as uh, a cloud of points. So, you can view it as, uh, uh, at first glance, you can view it as a kind of surface that is representing, but that is discretized. But Actually, it's volume. So we fill uh, the protein pocket with an ensemble of points. And the idea is we fill the, the holes, so the cavities of the protein. And those points actually mimic the shape of the cavity. And they, they are also associated with some uh, pharmacophore features according to the nearest protein atom property. So you end up with this representation. 
And to compare two pockets, which means comparing two representations, which are class of points, we use a, a method that normally is applied on millions of image, 3D image methods. But we think that it could also work in our case. And we have tested and did some uh, modifications and adjusted. So typically, if you're comparing a pocket cloud one against uh, another pocket cloud two, uh, first of all, you need to find which point correspond to each other. And for this, we analyze the neighborhood to uh, uh, characterize the shape around each point and also uh, the distribution of the pharmacophoric properties around that point, and we try to find is corresponding, so the nearest neighbor kind of in the descriptor space to 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 associate the most uh, close point in the second cloud. And once this association is done, at least for three points, we can compute a rotation and translation matrix and superpose the two clouds. So it's superpose the two pockets. This is what we have here. And once we have this superposition, we can compute uh, uh, similarity metrics. And here we use uh, its first key metrics. So what's important here is that we have a score. And in the end, we have a, a, a rotation and translation matrix that we can apply to other objects. And that brought us to the, to the, the next step of POEM, which is we have this rotation and translation for each uh, possibilities of fragment sub pockets in the database and we compare that to our target pocket. So we will use this information to align also the original fragments that were in the database as well and position them directly in our target pocket. We have applied uh, this workflow on uh, three cases. Um, we'll actually go quickly through them. So the first case actually aim at uh, first evaluating whether the Position of a, of a fragment from protein one to protein two because the binding site is similar, if it's meaningful and it can actually yield um, um, that, uh, like we can repropose one fragment to, uh, to another pocket. So, this is for the first case. And for case two and three, it was actually the full design that we investigated whether we can link and make molecules that are binding to our, our targets. For, for this, uh, actually, is, uh, in this story, what we did is we started with our database of protein subpockets and the associated fragments. And when we screen, when we compare the subpockets to our target uh, TNF alpha a protein pocket, we identify that uh, the HIV reverse transcriptase uh, were actually among the top hits, I would say the most similar subpockets to. Uh, the TNF alpha, and there were many of them. So we decided to, we actually got 79% of all the different HIVRT possible subpockets in our database that were in the top. Um, the score is uh, actually uh, high enough for us to trigger that we maybe try to investigate it further. So we actually uh, is suggesting this similarity and at the cloud so, uh, level, you can see superposition of uh, um, um, protein uh, pocket points that look similar. And we decide to superpose from this rotation and translation matrix we obtain from the alignment of the two clouds, we have applied it to the whole protein and visualize that the residues of the same uh, properties have been superposed. So the similarity that we have observed by comparing the cloud of points is also present as at the residue level. And we also align using the same rototranslational uh, matrix. We align the ligands and we saw that the ligands is also uh, well positioned in, inside TNF alpha. And um, we did docking also to see just uh, what would be the poses? And we saw that one docking pose is uh, nicely fitting the positioning of uh, of this fragment using only the side comparison. So we decided to uh, investigate uh, experimentally whether uh, the reverse transcriptase fragments can also bind to TNF alpha. So we tested two molecules that can that are uh, HIV RT inhibitors. So if I reference the fragment that I just showed before. And we tested also the laverdine and nevirapine, which are other uh, drugs that are binding to HIV-RT, uh, the same site, please. 
and we uh, could measure directly the binding using a micro scale thermophoresis assay. And we saw that uh, if everyone is interacting at uh, a KD of estimated at uh, 24 micromolar. Uh, just for the, the for, for the story, the original fragment of TNF alpha that was in the site was also at uh, approximately 22 uh, micromolar. So that's actually uh, kind of validating or suggesting that the using the binary site comparison, we were able to transfer run a fragment from a protein to another one because the binary site is similar. It's not expected for everything, but if it's, it can happen from time to time, then it would be interesting because we can use it to uh, design focus target focus libraries and uh, expect a uh, high hit rate so this is what we have tested with the next application on cdk so um, um we apply the same workflow so typically we have the cdk pocket and we screen our sub pockets to identify the most similars so um from from it we actually selected the fragments from the most similar sub pockets. And you can see this is just some snaps, a sample of uh, the fragments that were aligned. And they have been aligned all over the places in CDK. But the next step is to make molecules from those fragments. So we need to find a way to uh, automate the, the connection. So we filter them. And uh, in the end, we uh, decided to uh, connect the fragments which are in the hinge region of the protein to fragments in other areas characterized. Uh, we have four different areas. And we have enumerated the fragments that we can connect. So typically, uh, based on where they have been, uh, the area where they have been aligned to. And secondly, we also look at the connectivity. So typically, if the exit vectors, which are typically hydrogen, they actually point in, in opposite direction, we discarded because it, it would require a circular linker that we're not investigating here. And in the end, um, we have used the linker, which is a generative method, so deep learning methods to, to design the linkers. The idea here is that the, the linker was flexible and not to adapt. Since we are actually aligning fragments based on site comparison, we have some variability of the positions. It's not perfect. So it could adapt to it. And we have enumerated 1.5 molecules from this. But you need to filter when using generative methods because the synthetic accessibility or just by looking at the molecules, some of them are really, really ugly. Yet, um, so uh, from this uh, 1.5 molecules, we filter them by cleaning design that failed because the linker couldn't uh, actually link the two molecules, but just attach something to one fragment. We filter for drug like NAS, the synthetic accessibility using the SSCO score from Novartis. And um, we ended up with uh, a few uh, hundred thousand molecules that we filter by dissimilarity. Dissimilarity to what? Dissimilarity to molecules that have been tested against CDK8 in Campbell. Because the idea here is to find something new. We don't want to reinvestigate things that already exist. So we discarded uh, heavily molecules that uh, had any similarity with the ones that we have designed. And we ended up with 3K uh, molecules that uh, we searched in databases to test whether they can bind to silicate. We found only 37 of those molecules available and we test them all. And from the test, we identified uh, a few, uh, six, I would say, hits that are binding uh, uh, at a higher uh, percent of inhibition to CDK8. So that was pretty much interesting and uh, I would say uh, encouraging. And we decided to investigate the IC50 of uh, uh, the most, uh, the higher, one of the higher binders. And we could actually, um, using the same essay and a dose response uh, curve or binding curve, we could uh, estimate its similarity to be uh, sorry, it's IC50 to be um, around uh, 300 nanomolar. So this small molecule, which is still in the fragment space, we thought that for the size, the ligand efficiency is quite okay. It's actually interesting, uh, but we could grow it because we still have space in the binding sites. So we decided to improve uh, the affinity of that heat by growing. 
And for the growing after this uh, first round, we decide to um, investigate uh, other places that are available. And this has been done automatically using the same workflow that I presented before. Since we have actually designed uh, molecules using, using fragments in the other uh, um, environments, we decide to link those uh, that could be compatible with uh, these exit vectors automatically. So we did that using the same delinker approach for linking, and we ended up with uh, 500,000 um, molecules, sorry, 5,000 molecules. And we also filter by synthetic accessibility and um, other uh, FISCHEM descriptors uh, to avoid molecules that are too big or to contain too rotatable bounds because uh, entropically that's not interesting. And also for other properties and properties. So we ended up with a few hundred of uh, molecules that we uh, this time synthesized because they were not available in uh, databases, commercial databases. So we synthesized them um, with enamine and um, six of them actually were selected. So typically we have the first part of the molecule, uh, the ester is actually conserved, but then we, uh, we have this uh, benzene that also was conserved in, in this uh, site. And then the linker was varied. We tested urea, uh, piperidine, and um, parazol, uh, parazine, sorry. So with this uh, six uh, compounds, we could test them again uh, in the same assay as previously, uh, dose response. And we could identify the IC50 that decreased for, I mean, that was around, uh, I mean, compared to the other, uh, the small fragment IC50 that we first identified from first round, we uh, saw that uh, this molecule 94 is actually displaying an IC50 of uh, uh, at the nanomolar level um, range, which is uh, quite interesting because from uh, an empty pocket um, with just fragments that are binding to subpockets similar to our targets from a database of known information, we could transfer those fragments and make molecules. And in two rounds, we were able to identify an animal ligand of our acidicate. Fortunately, we don't exactly know what its binding mode is, uh, but we actually just show what one of the docking uh, propositions for this. So the key message here is that the point method has been adapted uh, to incremental design to first identify the first uh, molecules and test them and then increase them using the same workflow. Um, here, I would just like, I will quickly um, summarize um, that from this, uh, we can say that this is a protein kinase. Um, this is why it's working. So um, we actually saw that the molecules from in our database actually, the, the, the library of molecules that we have designed came from different uh, origins. Some of them came from kinases, of course, because there are many kinases in the PDB, but others came, the fragments came from proteins which are non-kinases, as you can see here. And interestingly, the, the last application was done on a protein that um, is not, uh, like, we don't have a large number of these proteins or these this shapes of proteins in the uh, in the PDB, and most importantly, they, they don't they are not in the data sets in the database of uh, subpockets and fragments that we have uh, because there is no ligand for this. And this target is particularly important because it's targeted in Parkinson and it's actually the target of the cache challenge. So the next application was the cache challenge using the same workflow. So I'm gonna go quickly through it. So we use the same uh, workflow. We computed. This, the pocket representation and we screen other subpockets and try to position fragments into uh, the, the target and we link them using the linker. So from this design, we have tested uh, them in, uh, I mean, we sent the molecules that have been designed. So 100 of them asked by the organizers and we sent it away. And from this challenge, it turned out that the point was one of the, our method was one of the, the main methods that could actually predict hits, uh, we have 16 of primary hits at this stage uh, that have been confirmed by SPR uh, essay. And uh, the next step was uh, to confirm them in secondary essays. And from those 16 hits, uh, six of, uh, of them actually have been confirmed in orthogonal uh, screening essays. And uh, they were able to identify the estimate decay 
from this for these compounds. And it's actually look interesting because the target is really difficult and hardly draggable. It's literally like a cylinder and you have just a hole in the middle. So um, this is quite encouraging. And so currently we are doing the heat optimization of these uh, compounds. So with the tech home, we actually came up with a novel fragment-based uh, drug design approach that can start with a pocket that with, known with no information that is known. Typically, we don't have any binding ligands, but the idea is that with that pocket information only and the PDB database or any other database, we can actually uh, position, we proposing new fragments into that pocket that are likely to bind or they have higher chances to bind. And using the narrative linking, we can enumerate molecules that, that would make a, a, a target focus library. Um, and this uh, way of doing was fast and pragmatic and it, it helped to identify quickly hits without uh, a lot of uh, computational, uh, well, I'll say uh, like uh, resources efforts. And with this, we were able to identify nanomolar uh, ligands for CDK8 and promising uh, hits for uh, the target LRRK2 against, uh, which is in a cash challenge. And um, the next step is that we have rooms for improve, improvement since the, the idea now is to be able to uh, generate the linker uh, directly in 3D. So we have the fragments is in 3D. But then when we, we enumerate, we actually have smiles. The idea is to do the enumeration and everything in 3D so that we can visualize everything. Um, and also to make sure that the compounds would be, can be synthesized easily. So the idea is to use uh, chemistry in the linking process. And finally, um, it would be also interesting to maybe uh, inspect the unmet rules, whether we, can, we will be able to make molecules that are likely to bind directly in the targets and will have uh, very nice uh, admit properties um, in the drug design process. That would be the next, um, I would say, endeavor for, for this project. So with this, I would like to thank uh, all our collaborators um, and also uh, members from my team, particularly my supervisor, uh, Didier, and uh, the professor, Marcel Hiber. Uh, previous members, Jeremy Duzafi, uh, Frank Da Silva, who had worked on uh, some of the methods that I used here, and um, the engineer, Guillaume Brett, and uh, uh, the currently uh, the uh, PhD student, uh, Francois, who also uh, worked on uh, some part of um, generating uh, like a retrosynthesis of the frames. So um, if you have any questions, I will be uh, happy to answer. So oh, thank you very much, Merveille. So I think we, we have uh, the time for a couple of questions. So I would like to remind the audience that it's possible to ask questions through the query question and uh, answer uh, tab that you can find at uh, at the bottom of the Zoom window. So we actually have a question from the audience from Marta Martinez. So how computationally demanding are those methods? Well, um... okay. So I say it's like a computational in terms of resources, uh, all the computations were done on my uh, basically uh, workstation. So typically, I use uh, like uh, uh, a few CPUs, like uh, eight or um, yeah, but I could use less than that typically. Um, I would say what actually took much is the linking process because it's a deep learning tool. So it's something that we did with GPU, but I know that it's possible to do it with CPU as well. Otherwise, it's really um, easy uh, to, like, it doesn't require huge resources. Like, typically, you do that with your computer. That's what I, I mean. OK, thank you. Maybe yeah, I could ask a question myself. So for the CDK8 uh, project, so at the end of the first round of creation of small molecules, yeah. uh, instead of synthesizing the compound, you actually uh, both purchase the closest one. Yeah. that you could find how close they were actually from the from the design hits yeah yeah, yeah that's interesting oh, well um they were close by substituents some of them were actually exactly the same uh such as uh, uh this one it was exactly the same 
But uh, for the other ones, they would actually defer typically instead of having uh, a methyl, uh, um, a methoxymethyl, you will actually have an ethoxymethyl mm -hmm. instead. So that these are the variations because we constrain the search so that uh, the similarity is really high to avoid um, mm -hmm. large changes, even though we still know that there are activ activity cliff study. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Maybe uh, one last question from, from me. Um, yeah, still for the CDK8 uh, project. So you, you showed that you created novel compounds that were on, and that a large fraction of the molecules that you created were not coming from fragments extracted from uh, X-ray structures of kinases. Yep. Is it also true for the molecules that ended up to be active? Yeah, uh, so typically uh, it was, um... Uh, I don't have the plot here for that, but yeah, we analyze it as well. And typically, actually, something that you can observe is that most of these molecules come from the same OET, particularly when they have the ethoxymethyl, they actually come from the same fragment. And this fragment is actually uh, from uh, heat shock protein 90. Mm -hmm. uh, the first fragment come from a protein kinase. Uh, it's actually a pyridine from uh, think protein kinase A. And, but the other fragment came from uh, heat shock. Uh, 90 and for the round two molecules, this uh, benzene fragment came from a protein completely different. I don't remember. I don't know. There, there are at least four different proteins with uh, benzene that have been aligned here, so, and none of them were protein kinase. Okay, thank you very much. So I think we will have to stop questions here uh, to jump on the other uh, presentation. So if you still have questions for Dr. Egida, uh, you can still uh, ask them uh, using the Q&A uh, uh, menu. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice evening. So um, our second speaker will be uh, Professor Alexandre Bonvin. So Professor Bonvin is the head of the Computational Structural Biology Group at the University of Utrecht in Netherlands. And as you know, Professor Bonvin has developed the famous ad hoc software for uh, modeling of biomolecular complexes. Uh, but Professor Bonvin is also developing approaches for predicting binding free energies and created the program Prodigy for, for this purpose. Uh, but today it's uh, another topic actually that uh, Professor Bonvin is going to uh, share with us. So he's going to present his work on shape restraint modeling of protein small molecule complexes with ad hoc. And if I'm not wrong, this results from his experience with the D3R brand challenge. So thank you very much, Alexandre, and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for the kind introduction and also for uh, the invitation to speak at this uh, 3D Bioinfo webinar. Then I think our first talk uh, was really excellent and a nice introduction to, to the topic and also what I'm going to tell you today. So this is the program, a little bit indeed of uh, the lessons we learned from the Grand Challenge, the Drug Design Grand Challenge, which was a blind um, experiment to predict both poses, but also affinity of protein ligand complexes. And then uh, basically what came out of all of that is our shape restraint uh, docking protocol using Haddock. After seeing the beautiful pictures of Strasbourg, I had to add one of uh, Utrecht as well. So you see here the center of Utrecht, which has a nice canal with plenty of terraces on the water level. This is much nicer than Amsterdam. You know, Amsterdam is overrated. Amsterdam, you don't have the terraces at the water level. You just have the street and then the water. But what's happening here is a lot of uh, macromolecular interactions between people. And everything in life is controlled by interactions at the microscopic scale uh, between molecules. And this is what we have been working on since uh, quite some time now in developing uh, the ad hoc integrative modeling platform. And we came basically from the world of protein-protein interactions. And today I'm going to speak mainly about small molecule interactions. So Haddock is an integrative modeling platform, uh, which came out actually of a limitation we had uh, with NMR to study macromolecular complexes or specific cases. Uh, but NMR is very good at giving you <clears throat> where things are binding uh, in those cases where you cannot solve the structure. And this uh, where information is something that we are encoding in ad hoc as um, some ambiguous restraints to really drive the modeling process. So we are doing a, a information-driven docking, basically. Um, 
since the early days of ad hoc, uh, it, it has grown to support a large variety of, of information. So any anything that tells you that a residue or a group of atom is important for the binding is something that we can use in principle. We can also use specific distance restraints, but also all kind of information like uh, small angle X restricting uh, and dry OEM data. We can dock more than two molecules at the same time. So that's one of the features of ad hoc. Currently, the limit is set to 20, but it's kind of arbitrary. Uh, but it only really makes sense to go to larger number of molecules that you are docking if you have good information to drive the mapping process. Uh, it does perform the, the flexible refinement of the interfaces, uh, and we have been putting it to the test in different challenges over the years, from protein protein to protein small molecule as well in a DFRIAR. So in a nutshell, uh, how are we docking, uh, doing the or, or modeling? So we start from a rigid body uh, docking phase whereby uh, using energy minimization methods from a randomly uh, oriented molecule in space, uh, we generate, we sample here a, a large number of solutions between 10 to 100,000. Molecules are rigid at this stage, but you could use an ensemble of starting conformation to, um, to describe some of the possible different conformations uh, involved in the binding. We make a first selection of solution after that stage and a few hundred molecules are uh, go into the second stage, which we call IT1, where we now introduce flexibility, but typically only at the interface between the molecule. So this is a simulated annealing in torsion angle space. So we are doing molecular dynamics to optimize the interface. And we used to, to finish with a refinement in a very short refinement in explicit solvent. And these days, we don't even do that anymore. This is a final energy, energy minimization. The scoring function, which is uh, 20 years old, HADOC is 20 years old, so we're celebrating this year 20 years of HADOC. Uh, is rather simple. Uh, it's simple, it's a linear combination of uh, various energy terms. You can still call it a machine learning model because machine learning is very uh, sexy these days. But at the end of the, of the entire protocol, what we are using is the intermolecular energy between the molecule where we have electrostatic 20% uh, Van der Waals interaction, so the classical and Leonard Jones potential, we have a dissolvation energy term, and we have a, a term that represents basically the information that we put in next to the force field to drive the modeling process. So the green terms, intermolecular energetics, the cost that you pay by removing water from the interface, or the bonus that you gain by removing water, depending on the system and the conditions, and then the restraints that you put in to drive the modeling process. And for small molecules, this is pretty much the same scoring function that we're using with slight modifications. We give much more weight to Van der Waals interaction in the first stage. But this function has survived many years of optimization, machine learning, deep learning. It might not be perfect, but it's robust and it does the job in many different types of systems that we are modeling. I think one of the success of ad hoc is that we are providing it as a web uh, service. Uh, uh, through a web portal located at VNMR Science UNL. Uh, this is where most of our user community is using um, our, our tools. So we have to date more than 35,000 registered users from all over the world. And we have served, we have passed this year actually the cap of half a million docking runs served uh, on our portal. We have been able to do that over the years because of the support and in particular of EGI, which is providing a distributed computing resource across Europe, but also extending into Asia and even the US. And 80% uh, of all the computing is actually done on this distributed resource. So the server itself sends in the order of 25 million uh, compute units to this distributed resource. And this is what is allowing us to provide the service to the community. Now, since the early days of ad hoc, we had the capability to deal with small molecules. And we first implemented that to deal with cofactors uh, like a heme group in a protein to be able to describe those, especially when they are part of the interfaces. But this gave us from the start uh, the ability to also deal in principle with small limits. So we are using uh, ProDrug as a back-end engine to generate automatically topologies and parameters on the, for the small limits. These might not be the best parameters, but they do the job in our hands and uh, we can automate the entire process. So you have here an example of, um, this is 2012. So it's a company, we are not part of this work. And they, they came to us and they came to using adult because they had the information to guide the modeling process. And at that time, surprisingly to us, uh, the small molecule, the classical small molecule docking software could not handle uh, experimental information. 
at least not directly to, to guide the docking, but only to filter. And here is another example now coming from Novartis, where basically they needed to generate, uh, um, they had the lead compounds identified by NMR, they had some NMR data, but they were unable to crystallize any of those compounds and they used HADOP to generate the first structural model of the interaction, which allowed them to guide their structural-based drug design in the second generation of the compound they created, they were able to crystallize them. And these were also confirming the, the docking port generated by HADOC. So these are just two application example from industry in that case. Now, we have been uh, discovering the small molecule docking world through the drug design uh, a grand challenge, and we started uh, in, in the second version of that one, and I've been participating to three of those. This was mainly the work of uh, Zeynep at the time and Panos, a postdoc and a PhD student. And there we worked on post prediction, but also in ranking and affinity prediction. I'm not going to speak of, about affinity prediction today. And the strategies that we have been using over the years to, to do small molecule docking is uh, are three. And, and the second and third one are basically coming out of our experience in, in D3R. So a classical way will be, we have some information about the binding site, which will be like, you know, defining a box around your binding site if you are running an autodoc. In our case, we define the residues involved in the binding. And then later on through the experience that we gained through D3R, uh, we, we realized that we had to do things in a bit uh, smarter way. So we started using templates uh, over related proteins in a PDB which have ligand bond to them, and this is linking very much to the previous talk. And uh, in the latest version of all of that, we actually use uh, the, the template-based information to de define restraints that are really driving the modeling process. So what we learned by participating to, to D3R, which was maybe trivial for the people who are working really 100% in the small molecule field, is that we should not you know, start uh, naively from an apple receptor, but if there, are, if there is structural information in the PDB, uh, we should do better, uh, a better choice of the receptor by selecting receptors that have something bound to them and ideally something as similar as possible to your target. This is also uh, the message of the previous talk. Uh, we also need to think uh, better about generating uh, confirmation and uh, how to select those. I'm going to say a little bit about that. And uh, we run into problems in, um, in D3R because we were accessing binding sites that were pretty buried and we were starting from our ligand outside the protein and then you have to fight against the Van der Waals interactions to get your ligands in there. So we also had to do a smart replacement basically of the initial uh, conformation. So we need for starters. So I already explained we are selecting from PDB the, the template receptors that have something bound to them. For the ligands in D3R, we started looking at shape similarity and we're using at the time the OpenEye software to do shape comparisons, uh, generating ligand uh, conformation and selecting the best uh, fitting one based on shape similarity. And these were given as an ensemble of conformation to ad hoc as a, for the docking. And then in terms of starting conformations, if we are able to identify a template with a ligand as similar as possible to the ligand we have to model, we will skip basically the docking, the initial phase of the docking, we will just do a superposition and refinement. And this is what uh, we applied in uh, D3R uh, round three. You see that in the first round that we participated round two, we are somewhere here at the, at the end of the, of, of the participants. And now here we ended very much uh, on top. So this, uh, we learn our lessons, basically. Now, this has, uh, in this case, basically, we, we have been removing the docking completely from the pipeline and only been doing by doing smart selection and smart superposition orientation of ligand, just doing a refinement. Uh, with the shape restraint protocol that we have uh, reintroduced, and this work is something that we are also using in the context of small angle X-ray scattering, so not for protein-protein docking, but you are using now the same concept for small molecule based uh, docking. And in that case, using shape restraints, as I'm going to show you in a bit, we can uh, use again the full pipeline, the full protocol, and reintroduce the flexible refinement, which allows us to induce quite large conformational changes in the ligands by refining them. So this is the, the protocol in a nutshell. The work is uh, from Panos again, former PhD students, and Manon, uh, postdoc, uh, former postdoc of the lab. So again, the key here is to be able to identify templates from the PDB that have something bound to them, which is not the exact ligand you want to model, but uh, uh, 
as similar as possible. And now we are transforming this ligand information into a 3D shape. So basically a collection of bead atoms or dummy atoms, which have either no chemical information. So in this case, it's purely a geometrical object, but we can also derive a pharmacophore model. And in that case, we assign properties to these dummy atoms. And then what we are doing is to, uh, we're going to do the full docking protocol, but we define ambiguous distance restraints that are connecting the ligands we need to model to the beads. Of course, we don't know which atom of the ligand should fit into which beads. And for that reason, the, uh, the, the restraints are basically ambiguous. So if the, if the shape is smaller, we're going to define a restraint from a shape bead atom to any atom of the ligand. And these restraints are really going to pull the ligand into the binding site, but also induce conformational changes during the refinement stage. So in the development of this protocol, we used uh, a well-known uh, benchmark uh, which has been used to compare different small molecule software, GUD-E. Uh, the issue with GUD -E is that the protein structure in that uh, data set are all bound form structure, meaning there are no conformational changes in the protein. They are just free in a conformation which is ideal to bind the, the ligand that you are docking. And this is a bit of an artificial uh, system. So we look for uh, uh, templates in a PDB uh, that will be similar to the proteins that, uh, that are in GUD-E, but have something else uh, bound to them. And we create in it that way an unbound uh, uh, between codes. So it's not an Apple data set, but it's a, a conformation of the protein, which is different from the targets that we are uh, uh, modeling. And this is available on our GitHub repository. So this is just a, a view of the, the different uh, uh, proteins we could template that we could find. And what you see here is basically the measure of the similarity of the ligand bond to those templates compared to the ligand that we have to dock. So the ligand in a GUE data set. So the, some of those are, are very highly similar to the target. And then you also have you know, at the end of the scale, you are uh, two very low similarity. This is based on the Tversky similarity. And for some of the templates that we have, we could also find uh, other templates in the PDB that have much lower similarity. So this allows us basically to measure uh, the impact of the similarity on the quality of the modeling. So can you get good results from uh, lower similarity compared to high similarity ones? So for the ligand conformation, we switch at the time to using RDKit, open source software, and for uh, uh, we basically sampling all possible conformation of all ligands. We don't make any selection of the conformations. We just give the entire ensemble of conformations to Haddock, uh, and this is uh, used in the uh, in the docking process. So basically, Haddock will uh, uh, we sample here uh, one at a time each conformation, and through the pipeline, the best conformation will be automatically selected, hopefully, uh, to make it to the flexible stage and, and the final stage. And what you see here is already the result of this entire uh, exercise for the unbound uh, uh, proteins and starting from small strings and uh, RD key generated conformers. Uh, the first column shows you the docking performance on the, at the rigid body stage of Haddock. The second column shows you the rigid body, the, the performance after flexible refinement. So flexibility is automatically introduced at the interface of each model. What you see on the x-axis is the number of models that you uh, consider. So if you see the one, it means that we take the best model uh, ranked by Haddock and we measure the quality of the prediction. If you look at 200, it means that within the top 200 model, there is at least one model of a given quality. And the quality of the model is expressed in color coding. So if you have a dark green and you only see dark green here appearing and mainly in the flexible refinement stage, a little bit here, but it means that you are within 0.5 angstrom from the crystallographic structure of the complex. Medium will be one angstrom acceptable to angstrom and near acceptable uh, 2.5 angstrom if I'm correct. Uh, and then the two rows are the shape-based protocol. So only geometrical information about the shape of the, of the template that we identify. And in the second row, you see the docking results in case of pharmacophore docking. So we add information about the type of chemical groups that should be located at given position in space. Now you see that uh, 
uh, if we look at the final results, basically both protocols give a very high uh, performance. So we, we reach 70% uh, near acceptable the top one. And uh, within the top 10 models, uh, we reach 80%. And uh, about 75% of those are of acceptable to extreme or better. And we also have poses that have reached the 0.5. You see in the case of shape-based protocol that actually adding the flexibility helps a lot. Uh, in refining, because we see we go here from a rather low uh, success rate in the top 10, or we could also say that our scoring function is not doing very well, but after flexible refinement, uh, the top solutions score really nicely. When we do the pharmacophore-based uh, protocol, we see that our success rate increased a lot in the regime body because we had additional information in the form of this uh, chemical information. So here are a few examples of uh, the impact of the flexible refinement that we do in ADOC. So what you see here is the difference. Uh, basically, uh, you see three conformation. Uh, the cyan conformation is the starting pose obtained after rigid body docking. Uh, the white conformation is the crystal structure, if I'm correct, and the orange one will be the conformation obtained after flexible refinement of the interface. And on top, you see the difference in RMSD between the uh, basically the initial uh, rigid body docking and uh, uh, after flexible refinement. So you see here that we are inducing more than five angstrom conformational changes in the ligands by doing the flexible refinement. And this is also driven by the shape information and the shape restraints that we have in. So this is really our starting pose was not so fantastic, but it converged nicely to the right solution. The same is true here, and this seems to be even more dramatic. So flexible refinement really helps in that case to improve both the ligands uh, and the protein conformation, but mainly the ligands. Now, what are the limiting factors to apply this protocol? So this is clearly not something that you want to use for uh, screening libraries of ligands, uh, going back to the first talk of this uh, of today. Uh, but this is more a protocol that you want to use if you need to generate some good starting model to do structure-based drug design. So since we have uh, uh, different qualities uh, of different similarities of ligands that we identified for the duty data set, we can basically classify and report the performance as function of similarity. And this is what we are seeing here. Again, rigid body on the left, uh, flexible refinement on the right. And in this case, we are only looking at the shape protocol, so not the pharmacophore based protocol. You see that if your similarity expressed by the Tversky coefficient is about 0.8, then we have an excellent uh, success rate. So you know, within top five, we're almost reaching 95%. Between uh, 0.8 and 0.5 and 0.4, you're still doing quite well. So within your top 10 model, uh, we are reaching about 70%. And the problem starts to occur when we are below a similarity of uh, 0.4 in that case. So based on, on, on this analysis and some more analysis that we did, we came up with what we defined the safe similarity performance. So if you are meeting those uh, criteria, then this approach uh, uh, should deliver you uh, pretty high quality models. Uh, so in case of the shape-based protocol, we need a similarity in terms of Tversky coefficient of at least 0.4. If we do the pharmacophore-based uh, modeling, we need 0.3. This is the Tanimoto coefficient in that case. And if the difference in mass between the template that you identified from the PDB and the ligand that you want to dock is less than 50 atomic units, then you are in a safe uh, region. And this is what is represented here. So again, here you see top five or top 10 um, performance of both ligand, uh, the, pharma, the shape base and the pharmacophore base, which 90% near native and uh, close to 80, well, 80 more percent uh, uh, within uh, acceptable quality uh, in the top 10. So this is working very well. Now, how do we uh, position ourselves compared to the, so the typical, the classical small molecule docking software? So this is a, a figure we took from the Jude E uh, paper comparing different software. So the, the color coding are giving you the, the, the classical uh, Flex X, uh, so Flex, Gold, Glide. So classical software, some of them commercial, and then in green, then we have our shape protocol, and in orange, the pharmacophore-based protocol. And this is the top one, top four, and this is if you consider the best model generated uh, by, the, by the software. Uh, so you see for top one, so you see the, the pharmacophore is here, 
the shape based protocol is about just below 70%. Uh, so gold and glide are doing uh, better than us. The same is true in the top four. Although in the top four, you see that the shape base is, is, is becoming very competitive. And in terms of best model generated, uh, we are uh, almost uh, on par. What should be uh, noticed here is that this comparison of the small molecule software was based on the bond from the receptor, meaning there are no conformational changes on the protein side, all the side chain are pre-oriented in a perfect conformation, while our docking was done starting from different conformation of the receptor. So it's a bit of unfair comparison to one adult. But still it shows that uh, it, it's a very competitive approach if you can identify uh, a template. Uh, now, a couple of years ago, uh, when COVID hit us and we all went into lockdown, so we started using this approach actually to uh, do a drug repurposing screen against uh, three targets. So we targeted uh, uh, the RNA dependent uh, RNA polymerase, MPRO, and also ACE2, uh, screening 2000 compounds using a shape based protocol, uh, pretty much. And then this was kind of an, an affinity prediction to some extent because we are using. Uh, the score of the, you see here the pharmacophore model and you see here the shape based model. So we basically ranking the different ligands based on their scores. And this is the top 10 ligands that came out. Uh, out of the top 30, we selected uh, uh, 30 compounds uh, that were basically tested experimentally uh, in a large consortium, IMI care project. And in our top five compounds coming out of the screens, two of those uh, showed micromolar activity. So in the seven and a 3.6 micromolar, which is actually quite nice. But these were in vitro assays. And when you uh, try those compounds in, uh, in cellular assays, the cells were dying. They were basically cytotoxic. So this was the end of the, of the story at the time. But all the information can be found at this uh, website. Uh, we put the, the same protocol pretty much also to the test in a blind, another blind competition, which was the GPCR doc experiment, which run uh, uh, late uh, 2021. Uh, we had uh, five targets. These were all GPCRs, which we had to model from sequence. And, and the ligands were either peptides or ligand-like uh, peptides. And what you see here is for one of the targets, we generate basically the, the, the best model we are here. Uh, and this was based on, again, on the shape docking protocol. At least there was some information for part of the ligands. And this is what we used to, put, to basically dock the peptide inside the, the binding receptor. A lot of group at the time were using uh, alpha fold based models. We used here simple uh, homology based uh, modeling for that case using modeler. Uh, you have to make the right selection of agonist versus antagonist uh, conformation. Uh, but this worked quite well in this case. We failed completely in the other four case. And out of this competition, basically, there was no real winner. So everyone had some successes and a lot of failures in general. So it's still very much a very challenging system to work with. This brings me to my conclusions. So I've shown you a lot of work on small molecule uh, docking. So Haddock is able to handle protein, nucleic acids, uh, glycan, peptides, cyclic peptides, and also small, molecule, small molecules. And especially if uh, you are able to identify uh, templates from non-structure in a PDB, uh, this shape-based uh, protocol, where we are basically restraining the ligands to a shape identified from the template, uh, shows a very competitive performance uh, with commercial software. And we also understand when you can apply it safely and when you should avoid to, to run it. And it has demonstrated its, uh, well, I guess its power to some extent and success in uh, uh, targeting COVID-19 and also in the GPCR doc uh, competition. Uh, this is all published, so you can find all the details and a lot of information uh, in this publication and all the data associated with the work are on the GitHub repository as well. Uh, you've seen pictures of the people who have been doing the work, most of the work. So this is the, the current team of people and, and many other people contributed to the work I've been presenting. But Mano and Panos are the ones who have been doing the shape-based protocol uh, and, and the, the COVID work. Siri and Mano were involved in the GPCR uh, uh, docking. And uh, in the very near future, I expect to open two positions in the context of the BioXL Center of Excellence in computational biomolecular research where we are uh, further developing ad hoc and uh, bringing up to speed to meet the exascale challenge. And over the years, uh, we had funding from different European projects and international funding 
that are supporting up to date uh, 20 years of uh, ad hoc development. Final advertisement, I'm uh, co-organizing um, an EMBO course, which will take place in September, third week of September in Izmir, Turkey, about integrative of modeling of biomolecular interaction. This is targeting more uh, macromolecular complexes. There might be a, a touch of small ligand there, but this is more about protein-protein interaction. This is already the fourth edition, if not more, of this course, which has been running in different locations. So look it up uh, on the website if you are interested, and I will be happy to answer any question you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexandre. So since we did not start exactly at five o'clock, maybe we can take some time for questions. So I would like to remind the attendees that it's possible to ask questions through the Q&A uh, menu. So don't hesitate to do it. So I could start with a, one question myself. So um, the approach that you are developing is actually uh, depending on the similarity principle that um, small molecules should bind the same way when they are very similar. Um, did you find cases where it was not true that very similar compounds bind totally differently? And in this case, was it rationally explainable in terms of interactions or you suspect it was a problem in the X-ray structure? So we have some cases where we looked into, into the cause of, of failures. And uh, I must confess at this time that I could not uh, recall what are the details, but we, we run into, because the, the success rate is not 100%. Even when we have a very high similarity, so so there are issues there, um, but I can not answer your question now. I will be guessing basically. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. But there are reasons indeed that uh, in some cases we we do not meet. So the significant are very similar. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be that we simply don't reach the binding site because also the some of those binding sites might be very buried as well. And this is, this is causing challenges in the way that we are doing the docking. Because here again, the ligand comes from the outside. It's driven by the restraints that we do. So we have to, to fight against the vulnerables. We decrease the vulnerables during the docking, but there they might be issues there. And in general, so we, are, we observe that more branch ligands uh, give more problems. But the shape helps a lot uh, because you have a much higher force to, to drive the things to on the right location. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> maybe another question. So contrary to other docking software here, you can uh, estimate somewhat the probability to be right for each binding mode based on the similarity between the template and the query molecule and the, the, the molecular weights also. Have you tried to apply those uh, um, parameters, those features to uh, know what fraction of the chemical space you can actually dock nowadays. I mean, by that, if you were taking the um, all the known ligands of a given kinase in Campbell, what fraction would you be able to dock actually uh, with a good confidence? That's a very interesting question, actually. It's, uh, it's a great idea, and we have not done it. Mm but it's a uh, very interesting uh, question to try to answer, actually. OK. Sounds like a nice student project. Yep, so good. <laughs> so I, I would be curious to know the answer. <laughs> we are, of course, limited by what's available in the PDB. And I think uh, mm -hmm. probably if you were to have access also to all the debt project in the pharma uh, companies, you will increase your coverage of uh, the chemical space, but that's the, the issue that we're all facing. Yeah, so a bit of a dream, yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank you. So I see that there is no uh, I question. actually have one question. I tried to write it, but I don't have the option, so it's really real. I would like to know whether um, you uh, observe uh, in the use cases that uh, this method actually work better for some characteristics of sites such as very narrow or even the opposite, very broad um, open bind sites, or whether you have actually applied on uh, sites that contain metals, for instance. Um, okay, so I don't know if Jude E has uh, metal binding in, the, in, in their sites. What I know is that we cannot handle ligands that contain their metals. So that's a limitation of the um, parameter generation that we have. 
at least to, to automate things, it will be it will require manually. And we have, uh, uh, in terms of the size, the, the, the shape basically of the, of the binding size, that's also something that we have not categorized basically. It's, it's a data set of about 100 cases here, so I'm not sure how much different shapes we will have in there. I think this relates very much to, to the work that you are doing. You could characterize that very, very nicely. Um, if you have good similarity of templates, I would think that uh, if you have a good shape, basically, uh, it will not matter that much. But if you have very shallow binding sites, there are, of course, many more possibilities to put a ligand in there, and that becomes problematic. So I would, uh, you know, narrow site, probably, if there is a shape in there, it's going to fit quite nicely. Um, and again, the shape information and the restraints of input is key to getting reasonable confirmation because we have that, and we saw that in D3R in first of the first round, which was a lot of a ligand, which was branched, rather narrow binding site, we could, were getting terrible results because we are not getting the ligand in, in those pockets. Okay, thank you for the insight. <laughs>